So welcome, everybody. We are now live on YouTube. My name is Dale Bondanza, and my company is DAB Enterprises, LLC. Uh, DAB's mission is to help small and medium-sized businesses make technology less scary. In less than one hour, I can make geek speak less intimidating for you and your organization. For a fraction, uh, about 10% of what you would pay another senior technology leader, I can help your business get started and pointed in the right direction despite the forces set against you. So why don't you give me a call today? My website is dabenterprisesllc.com. That's D-A-B Enterprises LLC.com. Again, my name is Dale Bondanza. Uh, and today on the seventh uh, pilot episode of Dabble Te Tech Talks, uh, I have a special guest. Uh, my guest today is Sergio, Sergio Colmenares. Um, Sergio has a background as a hardware developer dedicated to the uh, electroencephalography, which is EEG, and polysonography, that's easier to say than it looks, uh, which is PSG. Uh, and those, are, those, uh, those technologies are in the medical device industry. He has about five years of experience with projects such as hospital installations, uh, international regulatory processes, new device design, current device redesign, and many others. We're going to talk about a variety of subjects today, but I'll stop sharing my, my screen and give uh, Sergio a chance to uh, introduce himself, if there's anything else he'd like to uh, add to that. Uh, no, that's pretty much it. Uh, we can get more into detail about what I have done with those projects, but that's pretty much all. Oh, and I'm doing a master's in biomedical engineering. And I'm glad you mentioned that. And we'll also, before we get done, absolutely, and I'm sure we'll talk about it two or three times, but I want to give your band, uh, I want to give your band its credit, uh, the credit it's due as well. Uh, your band uh, and some, and my girlfriend asked me this question too, because I told you in previous uh, discussions that she's a musician. So she wanted to know where the name Water Plant came from, which is obviously the name of your band. Um, so keep keep that in mind. When we get there, we'll, we'll talk about okay. that. Um, okay. But for, as far as the audience is concerned, we have four subjects for today. We're going to talk about some communication technologies and how technology has affected communications. We're going to talk about uh, music technologies, which is a neat, uh, neat topic. And and you know, as Sergio and I spoke before before today, um, that whole medical technology could be its own separate podcast. As well as the third subject, which is medical technology, which is on things like sleep courses. Uh, and again, that may be a whole separate conversation. So we'll scratch the surface on a couple of these things today. You know, we're only on for about 30 or 40 minutes. We'll try and spend, you know, eight to nine minutes on each subject. Um, so we'll give, you know, Sergio can give us kind of the high level on some of that. And I'll drill down in some of those areas. Um, and then, you know, overall, what are some of the impacts of technology on social behavior? I'll include some awesome. links uh, in both the YouTube and the LinkedIn uh, when we get there. So with that, let's let's jump right in. It's 8.05. Uh, the first thing we wanted to talk about, uh, Sergio, or that you wanted to talk about was communication technologies and how technology affects communication. So what do you mean by that? What, what, is that, what does that lead sure. to? Sure. So a uh, little background. I used to study like philology and languages. So I spent some time understanding how communication works and how the medium we use to communicate affect uh, the communication. So uh, reading communication is way different from spoken communication, formal, informal, et cetera, et cetera. There are like many variations. So every new technology that comes creates uh, a new channel. And this new channel gives you new possibilities for example before having text messages we used to have like phone calls and letters right, right. so written was very formal and phone calls can be more immediate but then come text messages and i don't know if you re remember but before there was a character limit so you have to be very very efficient with your writing, right. you wouldn't write R U O K. You just put the letter R U K. That's it. So there is this reduction of how we talk or how we write. And text messages nowadays are more efficient and try to be 
very short and they're very similar to how we speak different to an email and something that we don't see now is that in a soon in a nearby future like six months maybe a year or two from now we're going to get virtual reality so we are going to have a new channel of communication which would be kind of like a zoom call but not the same and because it because it will be more of a of an almost interactive type experience exactly um, exactly exactly is going this digital channels is trying to mimic like real day-to-day -day interaction but it's not going to be the same so we're going to have different stuff for example uh, the blurry background is pretty much a, a common standard for zoom calls right and i don't know if you saw the news about a lawyer who was in the middle of an audience and he clicked like the wrong button a lot of sudden his face turned out into a, a cat filter nice that's hilarious <laughs> and it was like a very very serious audit it was like a congress audit and he didn't know how to go back and oh, all I, of a sudden i, he, I did now that you like, say that i do remember seeing that yes that was that was he, embarrassing <laughs> yeah and now and then you see four congressmen and one of them his his face is a cat yeah do, do you think sergio of uh, because the way you were starting to lay that out which was interesting was when we used to write you know which seems like millennia ago actual formal letters when we used to get a pen and a paper and literally write things and that was considered formal communication and then the phone call picking up the phone that was more informal communication and then as you said then we progressed to to texting so then the phone call became more of a formal conversation because uh the texting was the informal conversation and um and, and then email kind of wove itself in there and, and I think similarly now uh in my corporate in my years of corporate experience I would say emails are also can go either way they can be an informal and a formal source of communication but I think those of us who have kind of grown up in technology over the years and maybe you know we've ascended the ranks and gotten into manager or supervisor type positions you begin to realize that email should not be used as an informal method of communication because uh it can and will be used against you uh whether it's inside a corporate uh, environment or god forbid outside of your company so email communication uh should be treated almost like the old days of handwriting a letter as a formal method of communication whereas texting and again I, i'm curious to your opinion on this texting seems to still be kind of an informal conversation um but i'm curious if you think it should be treated as that because it seems like texting is almost you know kind of the same thing as email it can and will be used against you because you're texting on your company's phone or you're texting across a social media platform uh so other people can see it so you know one one misspoken word or one uh misinterpreted word uh can lead to disaster I'm, i'm curious as to your thoughts oh that's very delicate because the era before serious internet which current days internet is like transitioning between web 2.0 to 3.0 so let's talk about For like example. the era of yahoo that was like web 1.0 during that time our digital image was more like a joke because internet was interpreted as this weird technology that a few people use but now your digital representation is very very delicate and it's a uh, closer representation to your actual physical self like your linkedin it's a serious representation of your job your instagram is supposed to be a representation of the best moment of your lives YouTube is now like a representation of your work because it's now becoming more and more and more and more serious. Mm. Great point. Yeah. It it wasn't 
like that's that. a good way to explain those three different platforms. Where do you where do you put TikTok in there? I think TikTok, it's a variation of YouTube, but for ADHD people, because it's meant to be very short content. So okay. you can scroll one another and another and another. You, you can see a lot of talent. You have to like go through a lot of crap, to be honest. Yeah. And I apologize if I'm too informal, but... <laughs> uh, Not on my podcast. <laughs> you, yeah. you have to pretty much dive down to find the good content. But once you get the right one, the algorithm is very smart better than many of the other algorithms that one gets you really really well so once you find the right spot of the right things is going to share the con the content creators to you and you will be amazed what you can find there's a lot of talent but tiktok is meant to be short it's pretty right. much like a youtube is for people who likes to write an essay TikTok is more like video tweeters, something okay. that you want to do short and effective. That's it. Okay. So sort of this possible too. Well, along those same lines, it's funny you say that because again, just for our audience to say kind of a previous conversation that you and I had, which is again, a reason I appreciate, especially from a leadership perspective, when I, when I'm sitting in those, in those leadership chairs to say that understanding the current four generations that are in the workforce from from boomers to zoomers and you know uh you know i'm somewhere kind of there in the middle in the x generation but but you as a gen z you know i'm always curious and, and i like the way you articulated you know those three platforms youtube linkedin instagram what in your opinion and i'm positive <laughs> beyond a shadow of a doubt that you stay more in touch with this than i do what's the next Thing. What's the next social media thing after Insta, after TikTok? Um, you know, there it seems like they just tend to unfold every couple of years. Um, and then that one becomes passe or blase, and people just move on to the next one. Is there a next is is there a next Instagram? I think I not precisely as a next Instagram, but virtual reality platforms in mm. two years are going to be relevant and I, not because I figured you're going to say that yeah that's interesting not because they don't exist now because they do exist but it's because the launch of the apple vr set is that's going to be a failure like for sure it's too expensive and it's not finished but that item is going to be a precedent to the mass adoption of the mm. technology because previous to that headset we already had the magic leap and we already have right. the oculus but they're both like niche technologies they're for like right. gamers you you don't see for example your parents trying to use that right. but i see in two or three years my parents having to use that for a video call with my sister and saying like, oh my God, now we can see you. We can see you. Right. That's going to be the novelty. And I think there is Decentraland, but it's still more like a video game stuff. Right. But that's a good start. Maybe, who knows, Meta is going to revive the Metaverse and make it work. It's going to be mm -hmm. relevant. Right. But it's going for sure going to be on that direction. Okay. Yeah, no, I agree. I think that's a that's a that's a that's a great observation. Um as you get into VR, AR, MR, you know, mixed reality, augmented versus virtual. And and you know, you have I I have worked on projects within the last five years revolving around the Microsoft HoloLens. So you know, as you said. There's a ton of those technologies out there, whether it's the HoloLens, the Google Glasses, the Apple, the Magic Leap. Um, they've all been stewing for about two or three years to come up with effective use cases for both the general public um, and, you know, corporate America. And and I think there's plenty of applications on the on the uh, enterprise side, uh, but they're still not the cheapest to develop. So. 
Yeah, yes. that's an interesting that's an interesting topic. So so I'm going to use that as kind of a sliding point to our to our next topic, which was uh, which, again, you and I found fascinating because we, we both have a personal interest in, in music is, you know, music technology. So tell me a little bit about how we got into this subject in the first place. Well, music, it's a beautiful art and we love it, but we don't always understand how technology affects. For example, think about the music from the Beatles era, right? At that time, elect electric instruments were popular. So the, the born of the electric guitar, that was a new technology at the time. So rock and roll became popular. Nowadays, how many rock bands do you find? It's hard to find them. You, now right. you have... The other type of pop music, which is inspired by the synthesizers, the VSTs, the digital instruments that we find now. Uh, back uh, when Mozart was popular, the only instruments you could find was mechanical instruments. Electricity was not on the table. And why they were so relevant? Because during that time, uh, sheet music was new. So they could write their songs on a standard that didn't exist before them. So that's what make them so popular. Like, oh, they can actually write songs and keep them for posterity. Uh, re talking again about VR, uh, I have a magic lip and there is an software that allows you to play instruments like with your hands. So it's a mixed reality device. It's a augmented reality. So you can actually put on your living room like this kind of 3D blocks that work as instruments. And I already have seen like a couple of items working for that and making music with it. And that's going to impact the way we do music from now on. Like, don't be surprised in one year or two, we find a video of someone making a great song, but he's just playing with these augmented reality instruments using that augmented reality with the other subject that you and i spoke about which is artificial intelligence is the the creation of i, I think i gave you the example one day of i i went out to you know the usual that most people are familiar with the chat gpt um and and i pulled it with a few questions and you know said something about you know give me uh give me a give me a three bar chord progression in a certain key um and it spit it right out for me i brought it out to the piano and asked my other half to uh to play that chord progression on the piano not telling her where it came from and then i came back in and said okay she did that excellently obviously so i was like put some words to that chord progression in the style of Jimmy Buffett, as if I was sitting on a beach in Key West, <laughs> came up with completely unique lyrics, but sounded like it would have been, you know, God, God rest his soul, Jimmy Buffett, um, and brought those lyrics back out, put them on the piano next to the chord progression. She played the chord progression. I sang the words to the song. And you would have never known that we created a song and a chord progression in literally about 60 seconds. Yes. So right now, there are that's the good start, like writing. So you get like the concept of the song. But we are reaching, I don't know why it isn't as popular as image creation, but I think... Mm. Google has an LM technology, which basically you put a text and it gives you an audio file. So if you put, I want a, an acoustic song with a guitar written in E minor that lasts like one minute and I want to have like a happy mood of it, it's going to generate an audio. This is still hmm. lacking some consistency. So it doesn't always give the best result. But that's just around the corner. Like in 10 years from now, most of the people who make music or the broad audience wouldn't even play instruments. They will just like do prompt engineering, music focused. Wow, that's interesting. Yeah, yeah like have you seen the amount of people that uh, 
becomes an artist by using prompt engineering like uh, right geo he's a great engineer he makes insane videos with artificial intelligence like he's doing visuals out of this world so and that's you, and that's definitely what's coming and i think you know you used an example when we chatted that i thought you know to, to not scare people that, you know, all music is going to be artificially created. You used a great example. If you can talk about it and, and if this is still confidential, you don't have to go into it, but you know, you have a friend, I'll keep it generic. You have a friend that's creating a video through AI and you're helping score the music for that video. Yes. Um, so, so thankfully there's still humans required today. Yes. Today. Yes. Yes. <laughs> because uh, there's something people do don't understand and is that artificial intelligence has intelligence but it doesn't have wisdom it doesn't have criteria mm. like the machine by itself cannot determine what is right or what is wrong is the human who leads the artificial intelligence who determines that because all taking the example you mentioned there is the core progression and the lyrics you ask to chat GPT, but in the end, you are the one who determines, okay, this sounds how I want, or this doesn't sound. For example, if you didn't like a, a section of the lyrics, you want you can say to chat GPT, hey, I think this is not right. I want you to use a different approach. So you're kind of molding the results. Right. The, the good thing about the artificial intelligence is that it's taking out uh, kind of the part work boring part let's say it so it skips to you already got the result so now the goal is to kind of find yourself you have to be very very clear because the artificial yeah. intelligence can do it all but in the end in the end it's your responsibility to determine how is it going to come out how well, are you releasing to the world so it's interesting that you said, because the word I thought you were going to say when you, when you said, um, when you said uh, AI can help take out the boring stuff, I thought what you were going to say, which is interesting, and I'm curious as to your opinion on this, do you think that people's use of it, especially in the arts, whether it's, whether it's video, whether it's music, whether it's still art, um, do you think AI will take some of the creativity out of the process or com conversely um introduce more creativity I i'm i'm curious from an artist perspective like yourself i'm very optimistic and i say both <laughs> like okay. i have spoken okay. to a lot of artists and most of them <laughs> look at it as a pessimistic way like oh no ai but this kind of uh angry or hate towards new art technologies is not new like back sure. Uh, sure. around i think 800s before the windpipe existed there were only like string instruments so the windpipe was born and it was a much louder Brilliant. instrument so you can Brilliant. see like fragments written of uh like guitar players complaining about the windpipes and they were the worst instrument because they were just louder and they were going That's to take hilarious. over and it's like no my friend it's just a new technology to make art and something we don't see That's a is brilliant. that That's a brilliant observation. Yeah yeah yeah. 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 This, this... Because then you you with what you just said a couple of minutes ago that's what happened when they invented electric guitars. And then that's what happens when, you know, now we're talking about digital music. Um, yes, there is always some uh, hate towards new technology because it's against what you love. What like right. you get, Great if you point. get the Great nostalgia point. to sink in, you will always think about the past was better. The past was better. Right. It was better right. in the old days, but in reality, it was the same. However, what I do think is that technology has the power to amplify human stupidity. So new technologies is new, new <laughs> amplification methods. Like we, yeah. 
we're going to see new bad things for sure. <laughs> yeah, I, I gotta, I gotta, I'm gonna go back with. So thank God this is recorded because I, I so want to quote what you just said. That was, that was a beautiful way to say that AI will definitely increase um, human stupidity. <laughs> More than increases, amplify technology. Amplify. It's, it's a microphone yeah. for what we do. Uh, let's imagine the computer, the invention of computing uh, allow us to have faster communications on longer distances. Now, high speed internet, which is probably in the next five or 10 years. So we're talking about not Wi-Fi, but high five. Right. It's going to allow us to have real time, which is less than 50 milliseconds communications. Less than 50 milliseconds can make a huge impact. Imagine having a surgeon connected to a robot that has a less than 50 millisecond delay. So you, you can pretty much have a lot of uh, surgical procedures being done by a doctor that is not even in the area. Right. Nowadays, and great segue, great segue to the third point, because that's how you and I started talking about medical technologies, because uh, Sergio and I happened to be at a um, at, at a local um, uh, meet and greet one night. And uh, for for tech professionals down here in the South Florida area where he and I both live, um, you're down in Miami area, right, Sergio? Fort Lauderdale, but yeah. Oh, you're in Fort Lauderdale. Okay, so as am I. So but but yeah, Miami, Fort Lauderdale, we're all very close down here. So um we were at this conference and and Sergio's background is as a biomedical engineer so I was fascinated by that so that's how we kind of got into the whole subject of medical technology so why don't you talk you know with what you can I know you work for a company so you have to be a little secretive about some of the stuff you guys do but uh, I'm just curious you know what what's your area good transition from music into medicine uh, and how technology is used in medicine Hey, well, medicine is, it has a lot of fields, right? So the field that I work on is medical devices. So basically we interact with electricity and uh, this kind of non-chemical technologies because pharmaceutical is another branch, but that's more like chemical based. So what I, we work, what we work on is EEG and PSG. So they're both based on the signal recordings principle. So you have many branches of technologies depending of what you want to do with it. But EKG, EEG, EOG, um, uh, EGG. So it's basically translating the electrical signals of your body into a trace. And we currently work on that. Okay. And and specifically in the sleep area, which is interesting. And I apologize if my I think somebody's delivering something to the front door. So apologies for uh the little Bernie doodle down here. Uh no, if you hear right. her in the background. Um but uh specifically in the sleep technologies, like I said, that that's something we could we could get into in a whole separate uh podcast. But what are some of the technologies that can help, I guess, first analyze and then, you know, potentially help people sleep better? Sleep, it's a very complicated medicine because different to, for example, cardiology or neurology, sleep affects the entire body. Like you can have sleeping problems because you have a neurological disorder or you have a cardiac disorder or you have a physical problem. And it's a process that takes many hours and involves the entire body. So you need many variables to improve someone's sleeping and there is another variable. Every person has a different sleeping habit. Some people are night owls. Some people are morning birds. Some people need to sleep nine hours. Like physically, they need to do it. Some other can rest with just six and a half. So a good start that applies for everyone is to have a better sleep hygiene 
and to know which ones are the sleep hygiene habits that works for them. For myself, for example, if I want to sleep well, I cannot drink hour like four hours before going to sleep. Hmm. Not, like I normally try to go to sleep somewhere between 10 and 11 p.m. If I have a glass of water between 6 p.m. and above, a big glass of water is going to be a problem. I, okay. I like I try to drink a lot of water before 6 p.m. because okay. otherwise that's going to wake mm. me up. Temperature. I, I used to live back in Bogota. Bogota was a cold city, Florida. It's a hot area. And every summer, my God, <laughs> I suffer. It does does take a while to get used to this heat for sure. <laughs> I suffer a lot. And people can say like, oh, but you can use the AC and put it to the max capacity. But it doesn't work because, yes, the AC puts cold air, but the bed is still hot. Correct. Correct. Yeah. And, 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 oh, by the way, you're paying 200 plus bucks a month for, uh, for your electric bill to uh, bring the, and, and I know, because I agree, I was born and raised in the Northeast, spent most of my life in the Northeast. So I've only been down here in Florida for about 10 or 10 or 11 years now. And um, while I've accepted the heat during the day, sleeping is a great point. Um you know, uh, you know, my my Alexa device turns down my thermostat every night at eight o'clock, uh, turns it down to 70 so I can try to get to sleep, uh, you know, by 10. Because similarly, because, you know, we've talked about this as a funny example, too, um, gives me an idea. I should talk about technology in athletics and running, which is my area, uh, because I get up so darn early because the only time to run in Florida is at 4 a.m. when it's the coolest part of the day, even though it tends to be more humid at that time. Um, but it's definitely the coolest it's ever going to be throughout the day, whether it's December or June, 4 a.m. is going to be the coolest part of the day. So that's yeah, usually when I do my runs. Uh, but yeah, it, it takes a bit of adjusting. <laughs> but anyway, so we got yeah. off topic on your on the medical technology. No, no, but, but it's uh, within the same area because uh, contrary to what people believe, the most important medical technology is prevention. It's way better and way efficient to have good prevention technologies than having uh, corrective technologies. So, for example, the fact that you run and that Alexa adjusts your temperature, these technologies kind of shape your day-to-day -day mm. life. Great and point. whether you like it or not, it's going to impact the quality of your health. Yeah. So if there wasn't this thermostat controller, for sure you wouldn't have as good a sleep as you might have if you didn't have the tool to go to run around 4 a.m. because you have a temperature monitor, you wouldn't know that's the best time of the day. True. And like smartwatches nowadays monitorize more and more features like monitoring the sleep, although it's not precise, it's far from be, being precise. Like if you compare uh, the smartwatch against an actual uh, sleep technology scoring, there are going to be some discrepancies, but it's a good approach. It's a good start point. Okay. And we are going to see more of these uh, preventive technologies embedded into our day-to-day -day devices like our cell phone, our computer, our smart watches, and God knows on our VR sets. To, to help us do everything from sleep to, to what? To just staying healthy in general? Yes, yes, because there are already technologies that can monitorize your cardiac activity. Like just now, our smart watches are reading the heart beat, right? How many BPM? So you can sort of foresee cardiac risks. Now, yes? I'm just checking my heart rate right now as you say that, because yes, obviously every everybody who wears a smartwatch, whether it's an Apple, whether it's, you know, in my case, I'm a Garmin because I'm a, I'm a, I'm a runner guy. Uh, but whether you're, whether you're wearing an Apple, it's, yep, right now it's a, uh, 
uh, heart rate is 70, 79, 80, uh, constantly monitoring your blood pressure. Like you said, I don't actually wear it to bed, but I've always been fascinated to wonder what it would say about my sleep patterns. Like, what are the types of things that technology can do while you're sleeping to analyze your sleep and then recommend improvements? I, I think that's kind of a good way to wrap up this this segment of, of, of our conversation, but I'm curious how how tech can do that. Well, the best thing is to determine if you're having a good night of sleep. There's actually a score for that. So you can get like a, a number between zero and a hundred. Well, zero now, I'm talking about like 40 and a hundred. So the sleep quality is determined by the how many sleep wake REM and non-REM stages do you have so our brain like emits different types of signals depending of what stage of sleep are you on and there is uh, I have to check the American Academy sleep manual to determine what's the right amount of REM stages, which is the part of the night where you actually rest and recover your body. I think that cycle occurs like three, four times. I don't know. Uh, I'm not a physician, so don't take that with a grain of salt. Well done. So, but the point is that if you fulfill those stages, you kind of finish the resting cycle and you feel better, right? So the smart watches try to read your heartbeat and your breathing patterns and your movement. And if you activate the microphone, they can also read the snoring patterns to determine, okay, is this person within the norm or not? That's yeah. it. That's what they do. Interesting. Okay. Interesting. Yeah. So like you said, so, uh, and we, we said this before on both those subjects on music and medical technologies that I would love to have a follow up with you and kind of drill down into both of those, but kind of overall to kind of to kind of bring us uh, bring us all together. Um, you know, one of the things you also talked about was just the overall impact of technology on social behavior. And and again, I think you and I touched on it when we talked about, um, you know, one of the speeches I give often, matter of fact, I'm giving it in a couple of weeks at the Project Management Institute's conference down here in Fort Lauderdale is, uh, you know, I'm one of my subjects is leadership of technology. And uh, a huge focus of that for me and, and part of my thesis is that we currently have four generations in the workforce. Within about five years, we'll have five generations in the workforce. So we'll have those who are considered boomers, we'll have X generation, we'll have Gen Y, which is millennials, we'll have Gen Z, referred to as Zoomers. And then right behind Gen Z is Gen Alpha. Uh, and all of your Alpha Gen uh, humans uh, that were born after 2010 right now are about 13 years old. So in about five years, you know, whether they go to college or not, within about five years, you'll have the alpha generation entering the workforce. So in five years, uh, you know, circa 2028, you will have, uh, and this is part of my speech in the upcoming, in my upcoming speech is you as a manager, you as a supervisor could simultaneously be managing a 70 year old and an 18 year old on your team and three generations in between those two people. And like we've been talking about technology, whether it's the evolution of music from strings to woodwinds to electronic, that was a big leap from woodwinds to electronic. There was a bunch of stuff in the middle there, but um, yeah. you know, just to summarize hundreds of years of technology, um, you know, kind of similarly, leadership and management, you can't treat the 70 year old the same way you treat the 18 year old. There's just different methods to motivate and inspire these people. So. How do you think technology will impact social behavior overall? That's a very tricky question because motivation pushes what are your core dreams. So you have to find a way to synchronize what, let's say, boomers 
X, Z, Y want to do with what you want to achieve. Mm -hmm. And it really depends on the niche because technology is different from medicine, which is different from arts industry, which is different from like social industries, let's imagine like psychologists that they're going to have very, very different fields. And just, I would recommend something that will work for both cases is A, listen to your team members and B, be responsible of the decisions you take because the more technologies we have in hand, the more impact our actions have. Mm -hmm. So right, right in the past, when you wanted to communicate something to the company, you could put like a sign on a wall before internet, or you will have to like write by hand a letter to each employee. But now you can just send an email for a thousand employees. Or you can make a plan that can affect the lives of a thousand employees. So it will be hard to please them all, to be honest. And I believe leaders won't ever reach that. But what they should focus is to cause the less pain to the majority of, majority of the members. Because okay. either way, some, someone is going to lose something. So whether we like it or not, every improvement on each aspect implicates a reduction or a loss in another aspect. If you become fast, you lose uh, muscle, so you're not strong. If you become strong, you gain muscle, so you're not fast anymore. So that happens with leadership and decisions. So the idea is take decisions that cause the less amount of people the less amount of pain to the majority of the people. Okay. Good way to say it. Okay. And, and again, I, I, I love that aspect. Cause again, that's one of the reasons I was, I was happy to have you on the podcast is, and I think more generational leadership should, should take more time to do even what you and I have done just socially or, or offline, as far as just understanding, you know, because it's so easy to generalize that, you know, and you hear it in the news all the time, oh, millennials don't have the work ethic that that the boomers had. Um, and, you know, Xers are somewhere in between and Zoomers are this or they're, they're that. But until you really kind of scratch below the surface to understand an individual's, and you use the good word, motivations, what, what motivates them, what inspires them, um, you'll never really have a firm grasp on it. So, uh, of course, there's a lot of contemporary or traditionalists that will say, well, I don't have time to cater to everybody's needs um, because the, the work just needs to get done. And thanks to your technology, <laughs> the work is coming in faster and we need to produce faster. Uh, but the and again, you said it well, Newton's Newton's uh, was it Newton's first law, you know, equal and opposite reaction or was that the second law? Uh, that was the second one. Um, equal and opposite reaction is. You, you you just because work is coming in faster and you have to get it out faster doesn't mean you can do it the same way you've always done it. That's true. And there is uh, a subject that needs to be reevaluated. And for example, what you mentioned, the word et ethic and quiet quitting mm, is yep. that the relationship between employers and employees has changed a lot. Like we have this quiet quitting and people is not motivated to work extra hours and blah, 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 blah. But the thing is that before employee was kind of perceived as a paid slave, so it's like, oh, I'm giving you money. So you should be thankful that I'm giving you money. But what I what it's happening now, I think that employees find out that it's not a slave master relationship. It's a business to business relationship. But the individual is a business. And for example, if a company was going to make a deal with another company, neither of both companies would would be expected to work extra just because of it 
is a business. Like if Walmart does a business with at and I don't know, they're going to have very, very set terms and they're not going to go the extra mile just because I'm working with Walmart or just because I'm working with at and But that kind of business to business mentality has reached to the employees and the companies don't get it. They think like, oh, you should be thankful that you're working with me, but hey, this human being is investing his or her lifetime, life existence into your business. So it's a B2B relationship and they don't understand it yet. I like that. I like that. Yeah, that's a a good analogy. Yes, because... Uh, they they complain that they're quiet quitters and they're living, and it's like you're right. It, it has a some degree, but in reality, is that now individuals are understanding better how businesses work. Mm-hmm. And company wouldn't pay you extra just because you did extra, because that's right. how business it is. So now individuals understand, okay, if this is how a business works, well, I'm going to become a business. And now you see people who has like two jobs remotely and gets uh, money from different companies and they manage how to have two jobs. And it's because now this individual understand like I can be my own business. So I do what's better for my business. And before Hmm. individuals were not allowed to think that way because I don't know, a hundred years ago, or well, not a hundred, let's call it 60 years ago, companies were owned by a very small amount of people and employees were the broad majority. So you can have them like fighting between each other to reach the best one, kind of like a a competition, uh, the wrongly called the rat race, which is, you, you have a couple of them. But nowadays, with the communications, remote work, new technologies, now you can understand that a person can work as a business like yourself. You have your business right. and you, you do this uh, technology consultancy and now companies can reach you out and get your uh, an insight of your wisdom to help them improve their business. But you wouldn't just work 10 extra hours or extra weekends or if it is not beneficial for your business just because you're working with, I don't know, this person. Right. Yeah. So, so yeah, under that topic of how there's a whole bunch of subjects in there about how technology has impacted social behavior, because to your point, whether it's technology has helped people realize to your point that running your own business is not that difficult. So people have, you know, the term side hustle has been created in the last, you know, four or five years. And, and again, I, I truly believe, and again, especially with AI, um, that it's only going to, you know, technology has always been a, a um, not a linear assistance, but almost a uh, an elliptical assistance to human kind, uh, but in both aspects, in both the bad and the good, um, AI, I will, I believe will take that to the next scale that AI will, you know, it's no longer, uh, you know, um, an exponential path. Now it's becoming a logarithmic path. So now it's going to accelerate human intelligence and stupidity, um, logarithmically. Um, and, and that's why when, when people talk about, you know, the, the concepts of, you know, Hey, we were supposed to have flying cars by now. Well, technically we already do. They're called drones. Um, (laughs) Hey, we were supposed to have, uh, we were supposed to have, um, you know, uh, the fact that we're talking over video or to your point, VR or well, yeah, VR, AR, which is mixed mixed reality is really people don't use the word MR, but that's really what most of that is. Virtual reality is there is no other reality. Um, Augmented is just, you know, you're you're substituting and then mixed reality is a little bit of both. So the mixed reality is really what that next gen is. So 
But my it's friend, unfortunately, we are almost at the top of our time here. But um, any any kind of final or closing thoughts? Uh, be careful with technology and take the best out of it. Good way to good way to summarize it. And and real briefly, again, I wanted to you know I, I didn't want to forget that. Uh, uh, again, besides being a biomedical engineer in the medical device industry as uh, as how you bring in your day-to-day -day paycheck, um, you're also an incredibly talented musician, and you're part of a band uh, by the name of Water Plant, uh, who has uh, both your own YouTube channel as well as your band's YouTube channel. You have, for those located here in South Florida... Um, you know, hopefully, hopefully this doesn't date this podcast, but we are here in the in the September time frame of 2023, and your band has an upcoming gig in October. Uh, maybe we just yes. want to give that quick announcement. Where where are you guys going to be playing in October? What time in uh, the sandbox location? The sandbox, so yeah, the sandbox stage, which is at Miami Beach. I'm going to send you the Evan Bright link because for some reason. Google address says the sandbar, but the bar is called the sandbox. And it's mm -hmm. ironically, there are two places. And they're both in Collins Avenue. So, huh. I, yeah, I know. Okay. It's, it, it happened to us the first time, but this time, Evan Bright Link, that's the right one. Okay. I will put that. I will put that Event Bright Link in both. Uh, the YouTube video as well as the LinkedIn comments. Or matter of fact, you can probably put it in the LinkedIn comments, but I'll add it into the YouTube when you send it to me. So Awesome. 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 Cool. Thank you so much. Well, thank you, Sergio. I appreciate your time. Um, it was great talking to you and, and appreciate all those subjects. And like we said, we'll we'll probably do a follow-up deep dive, at least on a couple of those, including the uh the medical and and the and the music side. So with that, just want to thank my audience as well. <laughs>